yet. And then I'm just going to talk a little bit about the session and then I will turn it over to our presenters. So we took the week mostly off from the ULBLC sessions last week since it was staff development week and we had a lot of other cool stuff planned. Um, but we're back in action this week and I'm really excited uh, to have this session today beyond the donut. Um, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put those questions in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on those while Suzanne and Audrey are presenting so that they don't have to try to look at their chats and their screen and all that stuff at the same time. Um, but if you have questions, whether they're content related or technical questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, if you have any tech issues, again, please put those in the chat. Just know that if we can't come up with a solution, this is being recorded and it will be on the library's YouTube channel and it'll also be up on our ULVLC LibGuide. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat in case you are not familiar with it, but if you are here, you probably are. Um, that is where we have our calendar posted and then we also have archived sessions on that site. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenters today, uh, Audrey Sage and Suzanne Sawyer. So I will let y'all take it away. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, and Jenny, thanks for organizing the ULVLC webinar series. That just rolls right off the tongue, ULVLC. Um, but it's been really informative and I think a good community builder. So we're honored to be a part of it in this sort of minor way with this presentation. So thanks. Um, to everyone listening, um, it, just kind of fair warning because it's always good practice to start with caveats, right? Um, I, we did give this presentation before at a staff development week, um, I think in 2018. So if you were here for that presentation, then this may be a repeat for you. We would love for you to stick around um, and sticking around, you know, gets you a place on our preservation all-star team. So, um, but no, no offense taken if, if you want to step out. So Beyond the Donut uh, grew out of our experience of sort of regularly having visitors um, stop by Preservation Services to visit our beloved nearly 40-year-old donut, turns 40 year later this year. Um, and while we're happy to host the donut, uh, we enjoy that it brings folks to our off the beaten path preservation lab. Um, we always try to take the opportunity to sort of tell folks um, what we do and who we are, but kind of beyond the donut. Um, it's also not that uncommon for our colleagues to stop by and borrow a mailroom key or for some other reason and they remark that they don't know what we really do down here. Oh, it's not moving forward. Sorry, my slides are not moving forward. There we go. So hopefully that doesn't do an extra. Um, so because we're housed in Jackson Library, folks sometimes um, don't know that we also serve the music library, the teaching resources center, and the small library and interior architecture. Um, most of our work though is from Jackson Library, including special collections and university archives and um, the music library. So you might've heard the terms preservation, conservation, and restoration used interchangeably, um, but they're not actually the same. Preservation generally refers to the overarching umbrella of protection of the collections, including um, protecting them from environmental factors like relative humidity, UV light rays, insects, or mold. Um, conservation refers to the various treatments that we perform to stabilize or repair books, such as mending, rebinding, or removing tape or adhesive. And restoration refers to the pro process of refurbishing a book so that it will um, be as close to its original state as possible. Rather than just stabilizing it or repairing a book so it'll function again, restoration is um, for some of the items in special, sorry, um, is related to the aesthetics of the object um, and basically for making it look pretty. So we typically reserve restoration for some of the items in special collections um, because those treatments are time consuming, um, but we make those treatment decisions with um, in consultation with the curators of each collection, depending on how the book is going to be used. Will it be used with a class or in an exhibition and that sort of thing? And if it's a particularly rare or valuable item, then we're likely to go a little further with it. Um, Audrey's going to talk about um, collections care next. Um, collections care is another term that kind of gets thrown into the mix. Um, and I just wanted to define that one too. 
Um, it typically refers to conservation treatments conducted um, to get general collections items back into circulation as quickly as possible. So over the years, our percentage of collections care work has decreased with the advent of eBooks and other digital resources. Um, and that's allowed our work in special collections to kind of increase in proportion. So some of the more complex treatments that we do on that sort of the work, we have more time for it. Um, and for those of you that have been around a while, you may still call our department the bindery. Um, the shift in title to preservation services is kind of related to that shift away from a sole focus on collections care work to the more specialized and complex treatments we reserve for special collections and university archives, and also the fact that we do other things in preservation management. Audrey. So, so I'm going to talk about general collection care, what, what has been a big part of the department's role for a long time um, and continues. Uh, there have been a lot of books that have been, there's been a lot of weeding, there's been a lot of change in the library with um, electronic resources and um, a lot of, there's so many different attitudes about what's going to happen to libraries and overall what I hear the most is that people People love the books, that people love the e-resources, so it makes a nice balance between uh, the two, two resources and it's great that the library provides the space and the materials and the opportunity for patrons and researchers to use both um, physical books and electronic resources and have the space to do it and to meet with their groups. So you wanna, there we go. So, and with, with the general um, circulating collection, our goal is to mend them, get them back into a, a functioning state. Um, <clears throat> generally, books are put together in two different ways. There's adhesive bindings, and then there's books that are sewn into signatures if they're printed and um, bound and sewn together. So those two different types, and here, the book in the upper middle, that that um, damage there where the text block is split, it breaks into several parts or sometimes just two parts, generally happens with adhesive bound books where the glue gets really hard and brittle and, and um, with adhesive binding, it's just a stack of pages that are glued along the, that back edge. So if you have really good glue that's flexible, they'll hold up for a really long time if, if it's, um, not such a good glue that was used and they crack and break. I'm sure some of you have had um, books that when you open them up, you hear that pop when the, when the glue breaks. Anyway, so, <coughs> excuse me. On this slide, there's up the left hand is a lot of times paper pages get torn. People get too aggressive when they're turning pages or the pa paper may be very fragile. So we'll mend tears, we'll, um, reform the text blocks when it splits, it's adhesive bound. And the upper right hand corner shows where a lot of times a, if a text block is heavy or uh, there's a lot of reasons why, but a lot of times the end sheet will pull away from the cover. So that shows that where it's pulled away and we're able to um, put some adhesive down in there and reattach that cover. It's a nice simple fix. Um, the, the lower left hand example shows where the backing cloth on the spine along the um, adhesive or the ad adhesive binding may have pulled away and we can re-glue that as well. And the bottom right hand shows a, a, another section of a book that had come out from the text block. So sometimes it helps to clear off the old glue and, um, and get that back, put back in there if that section um, clean it up and re-adhesive bind it. Sometimes we'll take a book apart completely page by page and re-adhesive bind it if we, we need to. So this shows just a nice little snapshot of things that come down from access services, circulating books, well-used books. Um, sometimes when people have checked a book out and it's worn and been and the spine wears out and it may fall off. People feel like they're gonna get charged for that. But a lot of the, a lot of things that we see are 
general wear and tear on a book when it's been put into book bags and boxes and carried around and opened and closed a lot. Then the, the cloth covering or if it was bound in paper, the paper just wears out, especially that front hinge, you know, the front cover gets opened a lot and um, people pull books off the shelf from the top edge, which um, is a common, one of the most common um, wears and tears we see where that, that spine is, is torn away from people pulling it off the shelf instead of, um, you know, you, you push the two back so books on either side of a book so you can pull the one out off of the shelf is the better way, the pref preferred way to remove a book off the shelf. So that's just ni a nice little snapshot of some worn out books that came down to us. So we have a technique in a lot of cases <clears throat> where a spine, where a book spine is simply just worn out, the end sheets are in good shape, the text block is solid. We can trim off the old spine, cut a new piece of book cloth and um, fit a new <clears throat> new spine onto the book and uh, tuck, tuck little tabs up around and under the end sheets and tuck it up under the original covering. And once it's done, it's back in action and it looks it looks pretty good. I think it's a nice quick and easy easy repair um, that doesn't take too much time or materials and and is really um, I think it's very uh, what's the word effective. I'll use effective. <laughs> this slide shows a book that had that spine repair done and and a lot of times we can. Um, preserve the original spine cloth and trim that down and uh, attach it to the outside. So it, the book can look relatively close to how it was originally published, um, but is in better shape and not torn up anymore. Tape people, so as I said, people are afraid they're gonna get um, charged money if a book is falling apart or pages are falling out or the spine has come off or come away from the book. Um, so they try to fix it themselves. And most people think tape is the solution and, and actually tape is, is evil and the enemy of books. <laughs> and this, uh, this is a funny picture here where one of the, one of the more odd things I've seen with tape people, somebody had, in order to not write <clears throat> on the actual page of the book, they put tape over the text and then underlined with pencil on the tape instead of on the paper. It's very strange. There's always something new. So always something different that we see, but I've seen, there was some funky duct tape with kissy lips on it that somebody used to reattach the spine to the book. I've got a picture of that somewhere. But I've seen, uh, you know, electrical tape comes in different colors, so they try to match the electrical tape to the book, so you can't tell they've fixed it. Um, first aid tape, strapping tape, scotch tape, washi tape, all sorts of tapes. There's probably some that I, I don't know, I've just seen it all. It's, and that, but with tape, it leaves a sticky residue, and sometimes um, trying to remove tape will pull the fibers out. It may remove the ink. Um, I had to carefully remove the tape off of this page to make sure that the ink wasn't going to pull up with the tape. Um, you can use some solvents, but sometimes those do more harm than good. Uh, there's a little uh, crepe eraser that will, can pull adhesive off, but uh, you have to be careful because some pages are very fragile and, um, and they tear easily or you remove the information on the page by uh, even rubbing anything across it. So post-it notes leave a residue so we don't advocate using any even the little post-it little tabs that scotch sells to um, people to stick in the books to make notes flags I think they're called even those they leave they leave residue and I've seen where people remove those and it tears out a piece of the paper. So anyway off my soapbox my anti-tape Going back to that other one, it had the paper, paper mending picture. Um, so we use uh, rice starch paste. You can use wheat starch paste and thin pieces of Japanese tissue. This picture shows a map that's being repaired. Um, 
you can carefully adhere uh, a, a thin Japanese tissue to uh, the back of the map or to a page um, to try to match the weight. You don't want to put something too heavy because the heavier the mend, then it'll just break at the edge of the mend if it's a fragile paper. So you try to get the least amount of fiber on there to make the best mend and keep it functioning well. Maps are always a problem because people have problems sometimes folding them back the way they were meant to be folded originally. So there's a lot of, of repairs that we've, I've made on maps through the years where they've just been misfolded and stuffed in back into the book. But, okay. More complex. So what's the next? Is that complex? Sorry, it's hung up again here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Extreme cases. So these are nice little pictures we've taken. There's always more, but you know, we and we kept a tally for a while. <clears throat> there it seemed like a time where there were a lot of dog chewed books that were coming in, but they're pretty, it's kind of crazy to see what dogs will do to a book. Um, we've also had other damage that obviously damaged by rodents, you know, other insects, bookworms will chew through a book. Um, the, picture on the upper left is, I think it was a stink bug that accidentally got squashed into a book that I think probably was from the book drop, which I'm not a big fan of the book drops for a number of reasons. You know, a book will drop in there, opened, and then something else falls on top of it. So then it breaks the book. Um, then the book drops outside. You have to deal with the um, elements, rain. But I think the ones that the libraries purchased, they're, they're better book drops to try to protect the books. And I know people like to be able to just drive by and drop drop the books in there. Mold is always a horrible thing to find. When, when we can, we uh, try to replace a book instead of trying to clean it. Sometimes though mold appears on, on books that are irreplaceable. So there are ways that we can treat mold, but preferably we don't like to bring mold into the building because um, it can spread pretty quickly and um, that, we don't want that happening. Um, you know, there's mold spores in the air all the time. It just takes the right environment and the right situation for them to bloom. So trying to keep a good ventilation system throughout um, the stacks where the books are housed, keeping the humidity levels at the right, right places so that it won't get too moist and it won't ha get too hot. You know, once you start getting into higher humidity and heat, then it then those little spores will will flourish. So, I know in special collections they try to keep it, things monitored, especially um, with dehumidifiers and temperature gauges to make sure. You know, with our building, there's so many issues uh, through the stacks with heat from the windows. I know that some um, filters have been put on that glass and just trying to monitor things to, to keep the environment from becoming um, a playground for mold. Uh, one of my favorite returns from circulation access services was the book in the bag that had been completely destroyed by something. But fortunately, the kind patron returned the book along with a new copy of the book, but I always was amused and amused by that disaster. Sorry, I muted myself there. Um, <laughs> as previously mentioned, aside from the collections care work, um, we often conduct, conduct more complex treatments. Um, and I think I can speak for both of us when I say that we both kind of enjoy that balance between the quick and easy work that we do for collections care and the more involved um, work that we do for um, generally for special collections work. It's just a more focused, um, sometimes tedious work. So it's nice to have that, that mix between the two. So um, in surface cleaning, uh, we're attempting to remove any friable or loose uh, dirt and grime from the surfaces, surface of a book pages. Um, and we typically don't do this for general collections unless it's just really bad. Generally speaking, we reserve this for um, particularly dusty or dirty special collections books. 
Um, aqueous treatment or washing a page or document is rare for us because we're typically working on books rather than flat items. Um, and it would be really time consuming to take a book apart, wash the pages, and then put the book back together. Um, however, it can be a really useful way to reduce the acidity and discoloration of paper. Uh, it's not uncommon that, um, that the sewing in a book is damaged or broken from either um, overuse or age um, of, or acidity of the thread or the pages. Um, so we often have to re-sew books. In the upper right image there, you can see a fairly large book um, that's in a sewing frame and we're sewing it onto tapes or thin strips of linen. Um, when we sew on tapes or cords, which you've probably seen cords, um, which account for those raised bands that you see on fancy leather books, um, we do those, we sew either on tapes or cords because it provides more strength um, to the book when it's open or closed. So it's particularly important on larger books. The end bands on a book are primarily decorative, um, but they do provide a bit of strength to the binding as well because they're sewn through the sections of the book um, and are one more layer of attachment of the pages. Rebacking that you see on the right um, is the process of cleaning old adhesive off of a spine, uh, reconsolidating it with paste or another kind of adhesive, rounding it in a backing press, um, as you see in that picture, and relining it with one or more layers prior to putting the book cover or case onto the book. These are two um, pretty large leather volumes. Um, one has been treated and the other is in progress, at least in the images it was in progress. Um, new leather was put on the spine and the original spine that you can see in pieces there on the right um, can be re-adhered over the new leather. Um, and in the image on the left, the bottom image, you can see that the hinge of the book where the cover attaches to the spine has been mended with toned or colored paper. And that's an example of restoration or to make the book look more like the original than the new leather would have. That new leather would be shiny and pretty and, and stand out. And so this, we tone it sometimes to make it look more like the original. Sorry, one second. So reformatting and protective enclosures, um, when we can, we repair the original bindings of books. However, sometimes it is, we do have to reformat them um, into a different cover or into a binder. Um, for extremely fragile items, particularly those from the brittle book era um, that are of significant research or other values, sometimes digitization is the method of reformatting for preserving the item because the original can't be adequately deacidified or repaired. So we might digitize the item and place it in a clamshell box, clamshell box so we'll keep the original um, and then have a digitized version. So um, this is also true of some old newspapers and photocopies created in the later 20th century when their toner or ink isn't stable. We may digitize them um, and the paper breaks down and, but we still have the information preserved. And protective enclosures are just what they sound like and I'm gonna show you some examples here. So music binders um, are reformatting the sheet music into protective binders probably comprises the largest quantity of um, items on our stat sheets. Um, they're fairly quick and easy treatments to perform. Um, our music collection is a lending collection, so the music needs to be able to stand up to a lot of use. So we put those kind of flimsy paper copies into these binders. And that's our former student, Elena, who we very much miss. Um, she was a master of the music binding, um, very quick and good at, at her job. Um, and, but the primary focus for our students often is um, doing the music binder work. It's fairly simple and um, we have a lot of it. So they help us out a lot in that area in particular. Four, five, and four flap enclosures are one example of a protective enclosure. We often um, use these for pamphlets or loose items that we wanna keep together. Um, Sometimes it's to protect a more fragile item. Sometimes it's just to keep things together. Um, we do sometimes create them for books, um, but they're typically for a thinner, lighter weight item since that four flap enclosure is just made of cardstock. And phase boxes are like the four flap enclosures, but are a bit sturdier. Um, they're made with a corrugated material like cardboard, except it's a much safer, more archival version of cardboard, but it's sturdier so it can hold up to the weight of a book. 
We also um, create uh, protective enclosures for photographs. Um, we have a sizable number of photographs in SCUA. Um, many are quite large, like the class photo that's pictured there. Um, and we create custom fitted enclosures to protect them in storage, but also so that they can be handled and brought out to show a class or be part of an exhibition, that sort of thing. Clamshell boxes, another um, pretty common enclosure that we create. Um, these are custom fitted, um, made for the book that we're encasing. Um, and they serve as little microclimates for the items that they contain. Not only do they protect the book from abrasion or make it sturdier to stand on the shelf, but they also um, provide protection from drastic changes in temperature or humidity or other environmental contaminants like dust or pests and that sort of thing. And these are typically for um, particularly more rare or fragile items, um, or for example, the scrapbooks that are in the Women Veterans Collection. Audrey has spent a lot of time in particular um, creating clamshell boxes for those. Um, you think of scrapbooks and they have all that ephemera sticking out of the edges and all of that. Sometimes they're really hard to just put on a shelf. Um, so this is one way that we can house them to protect them. And this was um, kind of a, a specialty clamshell box um, with an integral book cradle. Um, and it's stored in the, in the box with the book so it can fold up and um, be in there along with the book and ready to use if we pull the book out. This book in particular had really heavy covers and weak hinges where the cover attaches to the spine of the book. So it's really easy when you open it to just flop open. So the integral book cradle there allows a way to have that book support just kind of built in. So as soon as you pull the book out, you have it there and you can demonstrate it. Plus, I really wanted to try out this um, design by Jeff Peachy, so it was fun to, to experiment, and that was the perfect candidate for it. Audrey? <clears throat> uh, in the 1950s, there was a book collector, Otto Eggie, and I'm, I don't know a lot of information. I'm sure there's more uh, that Carolyn could share with, but he he wanted to create some uh, teaching collections for medieval manuscripts, which was one of his passions. And he collected a lot of different books, some a, a lot of them for this that he utilized for this collection were some that had been damaged or were missing parts of the book. So he he um, disbound fifty different manuscripts and created fifty different sets of these collections. Uh, so they're in this collection, there are 50 pages, and the UNCG library was fortunate enough to have an um, alumni group, I believe in the 60s, to purchase one of these sets. So it's a really awesome collection of, of medieval manuscripts that range from the 1100s up to 17, 1700s, 16th century, it says here. Um, but it's a huge variety, um, shows there's different from different countries on uh, different styles, different types of illumination, materials used. There's, um, it's just fascinating to look at them. And when they were originally manufactured, um, when he put them together, they were, there were pieces of mylar that were laid over it. And they, these were, um, linen tape had been used to adhere them to these little paper folders. And um, some of that was, it was creating issues with the collection. So I came up with a way to rehouse them. I wrapped each manuscript in a um, unbuffered um, tissue and have them set into little recesses on some archival board. And so it, it was a it was an interesting um, project to do to rehouse these. Um, and, you know, doing the research and trying to figure out ways did testing on different materials with over at the in the, in the science lab with one of the professors to try and test and figure out which material would be best to use. You know, trying to make educated decisions for the future. You know, it's, you do the best you can and 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 uh, try to do no harm to whatever you're, you're handling. Um, so, so that was a nice project to do. And those these pieces are used a lot in um, research classes. I know that different pieces are pulled um, for teaching, and which is exactly what Otto Eggie had intended. So that a way for, you know, 
everybody to have access to these unique materials and to see firsthand, you know, what, what um, the calligraphy and the, the treatment and the paintings and, you know, these pieces range from, there's a two inch by three inch piece up to, I'm trying to think if it's, I mean, it's the largest one is the largest this box, but I, I think it's like 12 inches by 16 or, or something, something, something really large down to very small. It's a nice variety from all sorts of different styles. This is an interesting set. There were th there's three of these that are in the collection. They were little, uh, they're sewing sample books from students from the turn of the century. And they have, each, each student would have um, produce these samples within their little sewing notebook and it had descriptions of different type of sewing techniques. Unfortunately, the material, the paper that these books were made from are very, it's very acidic and um, very brittle. And we have, we, we made the decision to encapsulate each page to try to um, protect it, to create, again, a little micro environment um, to try to slow down that um, acidity, degradating the paper at an accelerated rate. So with, with this, we're able to take the original cover and create a new cover and those each encapsulated piece would be attached to a stub and, and rebound into a larger volume so the pages can at least turn. You can look at both sides and see the sewing samples that were done by the students. So we're able to use mylar sleeves for um, um, specific and special things such as this where, where things are beyond treatment um, and you just want to slow down the process. And I think, I believe these were also digitized. I think David digitized this set where there was a teacher an instructor who wanted to utilize these for a class a couple of years ago. So, so we do these protective enclosures. We've done all sorts of specialty boxes, creating the clamshell enclosures so that they specifically fit a book so it, it, it doesn't bang around. Um, we have a collection of miniature artist books which up on the left-hand side is an example of that. There's a book on the cello that was um, bound by M Monique Lallier with a, an incredible little miniature leather binding with a leather slipcase cover. Um, and so I made a, a nice little clamshell enclosure to house that tiny little book so that anything, any of these tiny books would try to create something that's at least six or seven inches tall so it's housed on the shelf and doesn't get lost anywhere. And then the, the poster on the right is a book that Stacy utilizes. It's a diagram of like the of different composers through through time and it's a eight foot long um, poster that's really interesting and she'll lay, roll that out on a, a table in the um, Hodges reading room so that students can <clears throat> look at it so it gets used a lot. So we wanted to come up with a technique and a way to, to um, house that. So with the constant handling it, because it's not, you know, super durable paper. So we lined that with a long piece of, of Rime, which is a manufactured webbing material um, that's inert and it's rolled around an archival core and then stored in a box. These are some other odd things that have been done um, with, there's another little miniature book up on the upper left that fits into that little slot. And when you open the cover of that clamshell, that ribbon kind of pushes it forward so you can take it out of the slot. Um, there's some artist books that we have that are unique. I know there's a, like a um, bottle of pills that were put into this same kind of drawer enclosure that was it's interesting and fun way to house those. And the picture on the lower left is a, a map, a very long, I'm trying, I don't remember the exact dimensions, but um, a really long map of London that was given out 
I think it was a giveaway, maybe a 19th century giveaway from one of the newspapers, but it's got a wooden, it's a wooden scroll and it's, um, then it's got a cloth wrap around, ultimately around there. So trying to find a, a way to um, house that scroll without it putting any pressure, trying to relieve this pressure on any point on that scroll, so. And we do, especially having, since we um, were moved into special collections and university archives, we've increased our outreach and instruction. Um, we've done classes with, um, on campus with different faculty and, and in different areas of study. We've worked with history, history class, literature, library science, and art, the art department. Um, those are the elements I can think of right now. And we've also done a lot of outreach with Gilbert County Schools. We've done some training with um, media specialists on how to do book binding on a budget with, you know, because public schools, of course, have no money, especially media specialists, and they're charged with maintaining a huge collection of materials for their students with um, not enough time or resources. So <clears throat> we've done that book binding on a budget for them in diff several different places. We've done it at a couple of conferences too and just trying to teach people um, quick and hopefully helpful ways to keep their collections in working order. Um, we've done presentations at, at some retirement communities like Wellspring and Pennyburn, ways to preserve your own materials like photo collections, how to house and preserve private private collections um, and we've had cl classes coming on campus for example from Greensboro Day School that have come to learn about what we do we did the um why can I think of it in the summer the Latinx group the what is that called the chance we've done that the last three years and that's been really ex <clears throat> exciting to talk to the students and show them what we do and see see the interests that they have. We're, we're tucked away in a corner of the library and a lot of times people don't know about the different aspects in different libraries and, and what roles people play. So it's nice to, to expose them to different opportunities. <clears throat> and we do have a um, blog that we try to put different um, postings on. I know Suzanne has done a lot of postings in the last couple of years about different projects that we've done. <clears throat> and we developed a libguide for our department and we try to entertain on Instagram and Facebook with different things that we we come across. <clears throat> These, this is, I'm sure this is a library science class a picture of showing some of the work that we do and the picture on the bottom is uh, one of the programs we did for Guilford County Schools for the um, professional development for the media specialists. And here's another photo that um, the coordinator at the time had posted with all the different um, teachers and specialists learning techniques that we were showing them and asking questions. So it's a lot of fun. keep muting myself. Um, so uh, we, like Audrey said, we created a LibGuide um, that kind of serves as a repository for um, book repair vendors for book repair supplies or book conservation resources, DIY book binding of any kind, um, disaster preparedness, and that sort of thing. And it's come in handy as, a, as something that we can kind of direct folks to. Um, periodically, we get emails or phone calls when we're not being called um, for the DMV, because our number is apparently one digit off from the DMV, so we get a lot of calls for the DMV. But when it's not the DMV, some, sometimes it is um, for uh, questions about how to do book repair and that sort of thing. So this is a good resource that we can kind of direct folks to. And like Audrey mentioned, we have a blog, Speaking Volumes, because we're so clever. Um, but we do like to kind of some of the more complicated um, things we do or more interesting projects we work on. Um, we'll write blog entries about them. Um, this past year, our student Georgia um, created a couple of entries for us, um, which was fun. 
So, um, and I think that's it. So thank you all for being here and um, eat a donut in honor of the bindery donut. And let us know if you have questions. All right, I wanna thank y'all so much. That was awesome. Um, for the purposes of the recording, I do wanna go through a couple of things that came up in chat. And then I want to encourage everybody to put their questions in chat. And I also have one that I will ask. Um, there were, was lots of love from Sarah to the <laughs> Preservation Services folks um, for all that you do. Um, Carolyn gave a little bit of extra backstory on Otto Eggy. Um, uh, she said Eggy was a biblio class. The backstory is that his collections were created before digitization. And the sales from the set supported his wife as she, as he was dying from cancer when he created them. Oh. And those Eggy manuscripts are amazing. They're so cool. So I'm really, I appreciate, I know a lot of the classes that I work with from that time period use them. So I appreciate all the work that's been done to um, preserve them. Lois asked about having the Kodak color control ruler in the picture. There was a, an example of um, that in one of the pictures shown earlier and asked what sort of what the purpose was. And Suzanne answered in chat that it's for color reference for the photo to make sure the lighting and exposure are right. And it is also for scale. She, she asked if it was because of scale and it is also for that. I forgot, it has a ruler on it as well as the color reference. When, when we do um, conservation treatments for special collections, we, we um, have a lot of paperwork and documentations that we maintain once we receive something and the request for treatment. We have a treatment request form that a conserv uh, librarian will fill out or an archivist will fill out. And then we do a treatment report where we put down all the details prior to treatment and then we then complete the rest of the form after treatment. Um, giving information about exactly what materials we use, what we did, um, just so that for future reference, people will know what was done to the book and what, what chemicals or materials were used on the book. And then we do a photograph uh, and have that filed digitally. So that's what a lot of times what some of these photos are from as well as is for our digital files and, and records for what we've done with the books. That's awesome. Okay, Maggie mentioned um, that she feels like the enclosures that you make for the artist books are their own works of art, and there was some love for those. Terry wants to know how old is the donut now? This year is its 40th anniversary in November, <clears throat> and we actually had met with uh, Dunkin' Donuts this spring to plan a big celebration. So I don't know what's gonna happen with that. They were gonna do a lot of things in the summer. Um, University Communications um, director was really into, into this party and in celebration of the donut. So I'm not, not sure where that's at, but 40 years old, that's crazy. That is, wow, that's amazing. Mark mentions that, he, that we're lucky that he didn't eat it because he was at the party. <laughs> <laughs> where the donut made its original debut. Um, a couple other questions that have come up. Um, oh, also some love from Michelle for making enclosures for new books that have USB and other sort of uh, extra things that are included with them. All the weird things. <laughs> it ends with um, music production too. The music music uh, producers have always have some weird format. There's always something some, like extra little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Charlie asks, is there any new technology that you know of for preservation or recovery of the antique acid paper itself? You can, uh, it can be deacidified somewhat where you can um, either wash it or there is a solution that you can spray on it that um, it's kind of a buffering solution. It leaves a residue there that hopefully keeps the acid from continuing to leach into the paper and the cover and all of that. But the brittle books, that's the thing with them. They really um, are so fragile that they can't really be treated. That was um, wood pulp paper and that kind of came in fashion and I think around the 1850s and continued into the 20th century. And just, um, it was a lot cheaper of a way to produce a book, but it was, um, the, the wood pulp paper is just so acidic and fragile that, um, 
I mean, it's very frustrating when it comes in because we can't really fix it. If you mend it, um, and Audrey had mentioned about this when she talked about mending, if you mend it, your mend actually ends up being stronger than the paper. So it just breaks next to the mend. So um, digitizing um, might be a way to go for that. Um, but there's actually been, uh, I forget when it happened, I wanna say like in the 80s, um, a, there was a law that you could no longer use that kind of paper. Um, I think most people had kind of gotten away from it anyway, but it's, there's actually, people are not supposed to use that paper now for that reason so that we can preserve information. That leads well into Marilyn's question, does the light from scanners or photocopiers damage the books? I would say um, not really, not for that short exposure of digitizing them. And, and that's one of those way the benefit of, of the risk there. Um, I, for a short exposure, it, it's probably okay. You wouldn't want to um, have the book exposed to light for an extended period. So sometimes um, if we have a book in an exhibition um, that we think is particularly um, fragile, we might uh, turn the page once in a while so that it's not sitting there um, getting bleached by the light. Did of you course, the worst that? damage is from with photocopiers or people trying to make sure that <laughs> they get a copy in the gutter. So then they yeah. press down and break the spine. So, oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. yeah classic <laughs> all right here's my question for y'all i just think um you have talked to us about so many different techniques and so much amazing stuff that you do and i want to know like what kind of training did you have to go like how did you learn all this stuff do you want to go first audrey <laughs> um i i have a master's degree in printmaking and so i've dealt with paper and prints um but I, then I got the job at the library after I graduated. So I've learned on the job and training, reading, um, going to workshops. So, and what we did when I started working in the library in 1991, what we did then was much different than what we do now. I've tried, as I learned more, I realized things that we were doing was not um, the best practice for trying to do any preservation, the materials we're using. So I've tried to upgrade upgrade what we purchase and place on the books through the years and develop that. And there's always, there's always more to know and there's always things that we learn that people thought were a good idea 20 years ago. Through the test of time, you realize maybe they weren't the best thing. You know, like I said, with, you know, trying to make the best choices and rehousing the audio manuscripts. So you try to do the best scientific evaluation that you can and hope that later down the road somebody says oh my god what were they thinking which you know there's some I know in the 80s they were laminating things which now it's just a nightmare trying to it's almost impossible to delaminate some of the manuscripts that were treated so but anyway so yeah I've learned along the ways through the past 30 years um, learning and, and connecting with people and talking and 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 trying to do best best I can Awesome. Yeah, and keep, keeping up with trends and seeing what's new and, and how previous treatments that we thought were a good idea, how those things change so that we can alter the way that we're doing things. But um, Audrey's right, that kind of happens where we think something was a good idea and then it isn't. Um, so in conservation, a lot of times or preservation, there are kind of two tracks that people take when for preparing. Um, one of them is bench training, and that is what Audrey just described. It's um, those of us that train on the job, almost like apprenticeship, where we work with someone more knowledgeable. We go to workshops and classes and that, thing, that sort of thing. It's a less formal track in that sense, but we're learning on the job. Um, and then there's the um, folks that go to conservation programs and earn a degree in conservation, which they're learning a lot more about the chemistry of the paper and the treatments and that sort of thing, um, which we, depending on where you train, we learn some of that stuff as well, but um, they're probably getting a more thorough um, education of the science behind it. And we're getting um, good practice on what the best practices are regardless of the science behind it. But um, my background, um, I have an MFA in book arts, which includes um, book binding, paper making, and um, letterpress printing. And um, so that background really made me knowledgeable about binding in general and about paper and how different paper behaves. Um, one thing I have learned though, since getting into conservation, 
is that binding with new materials to make a blank journal or to bind a book from new paper is a completely different animal than working with old materials. The way that new leather behaves is completely different from the way that drier, uh, older leather is going to behave. And same with paper. Newer paper is, generally speaking, going to be easier to handle. Um, the older paper might be more fragile, unless we're talking about really old paper, paper made, um, you know, in the 1600s or something. Those papers are actually better than some of the stuff that came later because they were made from rags, not from wood pulp. And so they actually can be sometimes stronger than papers that were made later. And on that note, I saw Marilyn ask the question, if paper is not made from wood pulp anymore, what is it made of? Paper is made from cellulose fiber, so it may still be made from part of a tree. It may be made from that outer, not from the bark itself, but there's kind of an inner bark. Some, some tr um, paper is made from that inner bark of a tree, um, but really any cellulose um, fiber works. So linen, cotton, um, natural fibers like that. But um, so you can make paper from um, your denim blue jeans that can be cut up and put into a paper beater and broken down and you can make paper out of that. Um, anything that, that is cellulose fiber or was cellulose fiber originally, flax, um, linen, cotton, those kinds of things. Um, so hope that answers it. All right, thank you. And then we had one more comment in the uh, chat from Aaron that at Texas, the archives classes were often in the same room as the conservation classes and the whiteboards filled with chemical equations from the conservation classes always frightened her, which yes. is something I understand as a person who fears math and science. So, same, same, but it's been, it's been, I, I do think both of us have learned a lot on the job and, um, you know, understanding how a certain material work will behave if something is going to be solvent in alcohol versus um, water and that kind of thing. I mean, there are things that you do pick up, but, but we don't do all of the equations behind it. <laughs> like you said, you really need to know more like what, what are the best practices based on all that stuff. So, right. All right, well, I wanna thank you all so much. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording. And- I Thanks, Jenny.